mentioned, it's a it's a very important part of a legal clinic lawyer's job is to do uh, public legal education and to come to these meetings and and uh, meet tenants who have problems. And uh, my colleagues on Bay Street are there making a lot of money right now. And I would rather be with you. So there we go. Um, um, Madison was going to put up slides and and yes, I don't see them, but that's OK. Uh, yes, we we are happy to put them up right now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I can just, I can start because uh, everybody's been waiting. Um, so I am a lawyer and I work at a legal clinic and I work at a specialty uh, legal clinic. And uh, there are legal clinics in all parts of the province uh, funded by uh, the Attorney General to, to Legal Aid Ontario. And uh, we're salaried lawyers and uh, we try and help uh, the low income community we try and find issues that are important for the low income community. And we try and advocate on a systemic level. Now, housing is a crisis. And, um, you know, the, the, the next slide uh, sort of illustrates uh, what tenants are operating on. And you all know this. Um, it's a landscape of high rents and little supply. And believe me, landlords know exactly the, the power that you have. So the, the next really important point is that, um, you know, let's start with the fundamentals. Um, what is a lease? Uh, what is a tenancy agreement? And it's just contract law. Uh, and, and what is contract law? Well, when you buy a ticket to the Blue Jays, it's a contract. When you buy a new car, it's a contract. Uh, when you go to a landlord and you say, I would like this unit, and they say, yes, you have a deal. And the $10 lawyer word for this is an offer. Do you want this? Acceptance. Yes, I do. And consideration uh, seals the deal. And consideration is usually money. So you go to Toyota and you say, I would like to buy this car. The dealership said, yes, you can have it. The consideration is the deposit for the car. You have a contract to buy a car. Um, I, I People need to think about marriage as a contract. The offer, will you marry me? Acceptance, yes, I will. What is the consideration? The consideration traditionally has been the ring. It's the engagement ring seals the deal. So in landlord and tenant, it's, it's, it's contract law and that's how it's based. So the next slide uh, talks about uh, what, what is in that deal. And a lease is a tenancy agreement. And it is not, it's, it's really important for tenants to know this. It's not a free for all. When you go and you sign a lease, um, there's gonna be a lot of stuff in that lease that the landlord wants you to agree to. And a lot of it will be illegal in my experience. So what does this mean? Uh, in Ontario, the government has decided that tenants, uh, it's an unequal bargaining power situation and they set the terms of what should be in leases and tenancy agreements. And, and the terms are basically in what's in the Residential Tenancies Act. So the legislature has passed this act and the, re the Residential Tenancies Act is the contract between a landlord and a tenant and you cannot contract out of it. And this is what tenants don't know. So when the landlord says, well, you can't have pets, illegal term. Your landlord says, if you move in a roommate, I'm going to move your rent up 50 bucks. Illegal term. The landlord said, well, I'm a really nice guy and I'm having trouble paying my mortgage. I, you know, I want to increase your rent $500 this month. Illegal term. So the place to start is the legislation. And what does the legislation say? And this is another thing. Tenants say to me, oh, I, we have this deal about electricity, but I don't have it written down. 
we have this deal about parking, but we don't have it written down. Well, the act says that your deal, your agreement with your landlord can be oral, can be written, or can be implied. So it could be written down. You could have an exchange of words. Or gee, if you've been paying, if parking has been included for a year, and then, you know, in the new year, the landlord says, you know, I'm going to charge you 60 bucks for parking. You had an implied term again. So this is all um, stuff that you will find in the standard form lease. And the and after long last, uh, the government of Ontario has produced something called the standard form lease. And all landlords should be using it with their tenants, uh, except they don't. Some do, many don't. So the next slide will show you what the standard form lease does. Um, you can get it on the internet, you should read it. It basically outlines all the highlighted terms in the legislation. And it's a good place to start. It gives very good tenant information. It clearly sets out the terms. It sets out whether electricity is included. It sets out things like the rent, um, what the term of the lease will be. It, it's a very good document. So if you're looking for a place, or indeed there might be landlords on this call, please use the standard form lease. Uh, the next slide. So it, we call it the Residential Tenancies Act. It's passed by the government and the purposes of the act, it says in black and white to protect tenants from unlawful rent increase, increases and unlawful evictions. It is setting the rules to enforce rent, uh, balance the rights of and responsibilities of landlords and tenants. Now that's new because in former legislation, the legislators knew that tenants got the short end of the stick and there was nothing about balancing rights with a tenant who needed the housing and the landlord who had it. Uh, but this is a neoliberal kind of sentence. And the act sets out how to resolve disputes through adjudication, mediation, and it creates the landlord and tenant board. So, you know, reading the Landlord and Tenant Act will put anybody to sleep and it's not for everybody. But there are lots of sites that make this um, information accessible. So I've, I've got a slide at the end. Uh, Community Legal Education Ontario takes this dense, complicated, sometimes arcane language and turns it into accessible legal information. So go there. Um, I mean, there's even a dispute, and I, I want you to think about this. Um, even the word landlord and tenant is very old school. It's very arcane. And in Europe, they don't use it. They don't like it. I mean, imagine calling your landlord a landlord. Like, really? But that's what we do. So you'll find words in the act that are very confusing, very old, hard to understand. Um, there are lots of organizations that will make this accessible. And the standard form lease, I think, makes it pretty accessible. And it was long overdue. Uh, they created a standard form lease with lots of information. Um, the next slide, please. So the first thing to know if you're a tenant and you don't own property and you're in a living situation, is the legislation, the Residential Tenancies Act, does not apply to every tenancy. It only applies to certain kinds of tenancies. So when you have a problem, the first thing uh, a legal worker or the board will want to know is what kind of tenant are you? So arguably, if you have to go to jail, you're a tenant because they're housing you. But the act says, no, you're not under the legislation. If you're a student at a university, they might be housing you. The act says, no, you're not under the legislation. Um, a rehab facility, uh, long-term care, are you under the uh, legislation? Maybe yes, maybe no. So these are the kind of questions that we have to ask, what's your living situation and does the act apply? And if the act doesn't apply, something else might apply. You might not be without remedy, uh, but um, if you're a boarder or a roomer in a house where the landlord lives, 
increasingly common in today's housing crisis, the act doesn't apply to you. Many tenants increasingly common are renting maybe a two or three bedroom apartment and then they rent those rooms to other tenants. Well, the act doesn't apply uh, because the head tenant is not a landlord. So these, these are, this is really a threshold issue. Uh, so the next slide. So what is a contract? The RTA is a contract. A contract lays out the rights and responsibilities between parties who freely enter into them. And of course, this is a, a bit of a myth. It's a bit of a misnomer. If you're a tenant and you need a place to live and your landlord has a bunch of properties, are you freely entering into the agreement? Not really. Uh, so this is a bit of a fiction to our work. Um, everybody is under a lot of pressure. Everybody is feeling duress about this. Um, you know, buying a car from Toyota when you can go to Honda, you know, you can freely go to Toyota and say no to Honda. But in this housing market, uh, tenants are under a lot of pressure. And I know everybody on this call, if you're a tenant, you know this. Uh, so, but the idea is, if you don't like landlord A, you can go to landlord B. The problem is we don't have a lot of supply. Uh, next contract, next, uh, next contract. So basically you have to think about the act um, in terms of tenant rights, uh, tenant obligations, landlord rights. And it, it, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, there's no mystery here and, and please, I'm not monitoring a chat, but if I'm going too quickly or there's something that you need me to explain, somebody please wave. Maybe Merritt could wave and uh, I can I can redo something. Because um, a lot of you are, I don't see you. Um, tenant rights. Um, so there are limited grounds of eviction for you. Usually eviction for cause, most common of course, is you fall into rental arrears. You have to keep the unit in a good state of repair and fit uh, for habitation. A good, you have to maintain the unit, no undue damage. Quiet enjoyment, right? Like, okay, you can have a party on Saturday night when you turn 50, but you can't have a party every Thursday and Friday night with your rock band, right? So there is a bit of latitude here, but, but really you got to, you got to be a good neighbor. Um, uh, you ha you can't harass the landlord or anybody else in the complex. Your rent uh, increases will be strictly controlled according to the act. And if you find your rights are interfered with, uh, you can go to the landlord and tenant board and make a complaint. Um, the next slide is tenant obligations. Very few people know who this is, but this is... Uh, Three's company, and it was a big uh, show in the 80s, and they were having trouble getting an apartment, and they were roommates, and the premise, of course, was the landlord was very judgmental fellow and didn't like Jack, uh, what's his name, Jack, living with the two women. So Jack pretended he was gay, and Jack was not gay, but... But that was the premise of the show because the super said, well, you know, you can't live with two women in a shared apartment. Well, that that ship has sailed, but that was the 80s. What are your tenant obligations? Uh, oh, it was Mr. Roper was the superintendent, right? And he just ran this little kingdom and, and it still happens, right? The, the superintendent tells you this, that, and the other thing, right? Well, how much you're going to push back because you don't want to hassle from where you live. I mean, this is the tension. So please pay your rent on time, uh, maintain orderly uh, cleanliness, don't interfere with others. Uh, if you want to get out of the lease, uh, you have to terminate on notice. There are rules about having getting out of the lease, which is increasingly not happening right now because people can't get out of their leases because you're moving to something that's like 50% more in rent and basically no antisocial behavior, okay? We can talk about what that means. Uh, the next slide is the landlord's obligations. Um, and of course, I love this scene. You know, I'm a landlord and tenant lawyer and every movie I see, I find the landlord and tenant plot. And this is the Godfather 2. 
And he is a scumbag, horrible landlord who's giving a really hard time to Italian immigrant tenants. And, and the godfather goes to him and says, could you please be a little bit easy on my wife's friend? And the landlord tells him to get lost. And then the landlord finds out who the guy is. It's kind of a nice scene. So the landlord's obligations, maintain the complex and units in a good state of repair, no interference with services, don't mess with their heat or their electricity, don't interfere with the tenant's use and enjoyment of the property, uh, respect the tenant's rights to privacy, there are limited rules about how often the landlord can come in and why, and the Human Rights Code applies to residential tenancies. Um, now, people think this is good, um, so right. Uh, you cannot say to a prospective tenant, I will not rent to you because you're Jewish. I will not rent to you because you are a single mother. I will not rent to you because you're on social assistance. But all the landlord has to say is that I have 27 tenants who want this unit and I am going to pick this one. And I am going to pick this one who is a white single guy who works for Air Canada and he's a pilot and he makes lots of money and he'll never be there. So even though they can't blatantly uh, discriminate against you, they do it undercover all the time. And there is so little supply that they can really pick the tenants they want. And the tenants they want probably don't have kids, probably don't have disabilities, have employment that makes a lot of money and they can garnish you their wages. And, and that's what's happening. So I have people calling me and saying, you know, I can't get an apartment because I am uh, hard of hearing. Why can't I get an apartment because I'm hard of hearing? Well, the landlord doesn't want to go to the extra expense of changing a door system or an emergency system for somebody who's hard of hearing. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to hire the person who can see who is ambulatory and who can hear. And, and this is the problem in the rental market that we have. Um, the next slide, please. So I have about a list of six or seven things that most people ask me about. Um, and we can just go through them, uh, you know, slide by slide, uh, deposits and charges. Um, you look at the act, only really a last month rent deposit is lawful. Is a damage deposit lawful? No. If you found the apartment that you need and the landlord says, I want a damage uh, problem, um, what do you, what do you, uh, uh, what do you say? No. Okay. Somebody's put on a question. So what happens when the landlord, when he can't hear, what? Sorry. Or maybe you can flush out your, uh, or, or, or can you zoom in with your voice? I can, I can listen to the question, happy to. Yes, good evening. No, I was saying if the landlord doesn't want anyone who is hard of hearing, what happens when he cannot hear? He, he doesn't want to be in anywhere? What happens when he, what do you mean? What, so, so no, I, it was sort of an example that if somebody is hard of hearing, the landlord doesn't want to be put to the extra expense of accommodation devices. So your question is what happens to the landlord when he can't hear what? When he cannot hear him, when he himself cannot hear, would he like to be treated like that? Well, no, absolutely not. But he's the landlord and he controls the property. And, and he, he, it's all about money for them. And it's all about the bottom line. And, you know, you know, it, landlords should be welcoming to new Canadians. Landlords should be open about single mothers who have children. Landlords should be open about people who have disabilities. But if there's any impact to their profitability, there are so many tenants out there you know they can they can uh, they can say no, and anybody who's looking for an apartment is having a hell of a time right now, and and everybody knows that. Um, the next slide. So rights of entry. Um, 
Generally, a landlord needs to provide 24 hours notice to enter the unit to effect a repair or show a prospective buyer of the house you're living in. Um, they can come in without notice um, on emergency or tenant consent. So if you've complained to your landlord about the plumbing and he's there knocking on your door with a plumber, I would say you should let him in. He's not giving you 24 hours notice, but you want your toilet fixed and he is being responsive. And I sort of get into these arm wrestle stuff with tenants saying, I want 24 hours notice, but really, if you want the repair done, let him in. And of course, it's a problem if you're having a dinner party and there he is with the exterminator. But um, so rights of entry is big and it's about tenant privacy. The next one relates to that. The next slide. And this is a big one now, an emerging issue. Can a landlord take pictures of your unit? So if you give notice, can the landlord come in and take pictures of your unit, put it on the World Wide Web? If you live in a place that's being sold, can the landlord come in and take pictures and put a picture, you know, on the World Wide Web? And one decision of court says yes, and then one decision of court says no. So I don't know what to tell you, but I think it's a real problem. Um, and really, take pictures of your unit before you move in. And when the landlord says, I want to take pictures of your unit, give them the pictures and say, this is before I was here, this is the unit. Um, it's kind of a good practice. And landlords should have pictures of their units before people move in, just to give a prospective buyer or tenant a sense of the place. Uh, the next slide. So that is, of course, Don Draper. And they smoked through Mad Men. And they drank through Mad Men. Uh, and, that, you know, it's a good slide. I like to use it for smoking. Now, can a tenant smoke in an apartment? You know, I'm pretty old-fashioned, and I think you're a tenant. You should be able to do what you want lawfully in your own home. Imagine that. But then what if the kid in the basement apartment has asthma and is allergic to the smoking? Um, the RTA is silent on smoking, and it goes to quiet enjoyment. And who's quiet enjoyment? And I think smokers want to smoke. And, and, and it's, the, it's a big problem about how we build buildings. Um, the standard form lease suggests that the landlord can tick off smoking or no smoking. I think it's a problem with the standard form lease because I actually think people can smoke because the contract, the Residential Tenancies Act is silent on the issue. But, but you know, I sound like a big proponent for smoking. I'm not, but I actually think people should be able to do in their homes what they want to do. Um, and, and it really is a problem about how we're building condos, uh, how crowded people are living now, I think if you rent a house and the landlord says no smoking, if you're not interfering with anybody, I don't know what the problem is. But it's not a kind of a politically fashionable view to take. So obviously the standard form lease says the landlord can decide smoking or not. And if you need that place, you are going to tick no smoking. And maybe as a matter of courtesy to the people with whom you live or your neighbors, you will smoke outside. But I, you know, I think it's a bit of a bummer and I'm not a smoker. And the next slide is even more controversial, marijuana. And when the federal government um, legalized sort of recreational use of marijuana, the landlords had a hemorrhage. Oh my God, people are gonna be smoking weed in their apartments. Well, where else are they going to smoke it, right? Like it's restricted about where you can smoke it. So this is the same kind of problem that smoking is. And people tell me that, you know, marijuana odors are more pungent than cigarette odors. You know, I get this. Uh, but it's a, it's a big problem. Um, but again, can't people do lawful things in their apartment? Uh, right? And, and then exactly, the odors come through the odors come through the apartments and and it's the way we build apartments. Um, I have, I'm not an Airbnb user. So I have stayed in a, a not. So I have stayed, and by the way, these are real books beside me. It's behind me, it is not a background, okay? Um, I have stayed in an apartment in Rome. I have stayed in an apartment in Berlin and I've stayed in an apartment in Paris. 
I hear nothing. I smell nothing. I see nothing. Uh, the way that these apartments are built, uh, really, uh, really, um, they're solid. Odors don't get through. Vermin doesn't get through. Sound doesn't get through. And we are building terrible condominiums. Terrible, terrible, cheap. And this is the problem. And exactly, uh, the odor comes through and, you know, and, and you might find it unpleasant. So you're going to have a battle in any kind of complex about your neighbor who, I mean, I don't like incense, right? Like, like you know, and, and, and people will complain about the smell of curry, which can be veiled racism. And it can also be they don't like the smell of curry, right? So, so you know, we have to live together. And we're not doing a really good job with the building code about how to facilitate that. But it's it's a controversial issue. And and, you know, think about, all, you know, do you want people smoking marijuana in parks, like children's, you know, playgrounds, the mall? Like, where should they be smoking it? They should be smoking it at home uh, with their friends. Uh, and, and so this is a real problem. Uh, and, and, you know, it's it's a difficult issue that has not been um, uh, right, uh, that has not been litigated and right. I mean. If you're smoking, are you interfering with somebody else's health? Absolutely. Um, but it is it is an odor, right? It's an odor and it interferes with how you want to live in your apartment, right? And, and then, you know, I, I've dealt with smokers who say, you know, uh, they don't want people smoking, but they drive an eight-cylinder car. So So thanks for... Thanks for polluting my air because I drive a bicycle. You have an eight cylinder car and you don't like my smoking. So it is about how we live together. And, and um, it's a, it's a really problematic issue. And, uh, you know, controversially, you know, maybe the north side of the building should be for smokers and the south side of the building should be non-smokers. I don't know, but it's, it's a difficult issue. Uh, and it's about a tenant wanting to do something legally and it's a tenant who's saying, what you're doing is interfering with me. Um, okay, the next slide. Pets. And this is so, this is awful, really. Because I've seen so many leases that say no pets. And, of course, the RTA says, if the, you have a no pet provision in your lease, it's of no force and effect. It is void. So why do the landlords put them in? Like I, every landlord says, I don't want cats. I don't want dogs, right? Well, you can have fluffy if you want, you know, uh, and it does come down to interference. So a bachelor apartment, three Great Danes, that might be a problem. Noise, size, defecation, taking them out for walks. Uh, you know, I would be upset if the neighbor next door had a snake. Uh, so it does come down to interference, but you can have in a in a, a apartment and condos are different. You can have a dog or a cat and, and you can raise a goldfish, you know, and you can have marijuana plant. OK, um, that's pets. The next slide. OK, lease renewals. And this is a key feature of the Ontario legislation and not too many other provinces in the country have it. So you go in and you sign a lease and they're customarily a year. Um, you can ask the landlord for a two-year lease if you want. Uh, it actually preserves the tenancy from certain kind of evictions if it's two years or three years or five years. Uh, but it's customarily a year. And so many people call me and say, well, my year's up and my landlord wants me to sign a new lease. No, 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 no. The lease you have automatically renews. Same terms, except for a rent increase that the um, that the province uh, legislates, and that's it. Okay, and you're in your fixed term for a year, and then at the end of the year, you you've got to lease the same terms, and you can get out of it on sixty days notice. But again, nobody seems to be moving, so it's a good thing. Security of tenure. I told this to the Court of Appeal a couple of years ago. You could 
theoretically be a tenant forever, okay? And landlords know this and they don't like it, right? You could go, I, I've, I helped somebody who moved into a beautiful apartment like in 1978. The landlord was redeveloping in like 2015. She lost her beautiful apartment. She wanted to stay there until she died. And it was a beautiful apartment and she, because of rent control, she wasn't paying very much. Landlords don't like this. They do not like deemed renewal. The next slide. Rent increases, you know, I think they're, I think it's the most important thing to the contract. Uh, it's the most important thing uh, uh, to the, uh, to the arrangement that you have. Um, the rent is the rent. The rent is really important. Um, it can only be increased every 12 months. Uh, the government tells the landlords that you can rent this year 2.5% because inflation is pretty high. You'll get interest on your rent deposits. You can agree with your landlord to increase or decrease the rent. The landlord says, I want to put in a pool. Will you pay $50 more a month? You can say yes. Okay. Um, and then here's the, here's the catastrophic thing that has really affected um, our security of tenure and our housing situation is when you leave, the, the rent of your unit will go to market. It becomes a it becomes a free for all, and there is no no rent control on units that were built before November two thousand and eight. So that's all the condominiums. So if you move into a nice condominium downtown and you're paying twenty one hundred dollars a month, and you need to know when it was first occupied, and if it's November eighteenth next year, your landlord could come to you and say, "I want five hundred dollars more rent," and you're out of luck. And this has really destabilized the rental market. And because I am a big television fan, I guess, and I shouldn't admit this, this, of course, is the premise of Friends. How do those people live in these fabulous apartments in Greenwich Village? And they don't even appear to have jobs. Well, that's because they're living in Grandma's apartment. And they think old Mrs. Geller is still the tenant. And they're in this huge apartment and they are paying nothing because the rent is controlled for the sitting tenant. But as soon as she dies, as soon as she's evicted, as soon as she moves, the rent on that unit goes to market. And that's why the landlords don't want you to sublet, don't want you to give the lease to your friends uh, because they want the opportunity to send that rent to market. And the next slide. assignments and sublets. It used to be the case that you had an apartment and you had a, a job to go to in Vancouver. So you wanted to give your apartment to your sister for a year and you would go to Vancouver and work and then you would come back and your sister would say, this is great. Here's your apartment back. You technically need your landlord's permission to do that. In, a, in this free for all escalating rent market, is the landlord going to say yes? You know, if I were a landlord, I'd be saying no. Because I want you to give up that unit so I can get somebody else in there to pay a lot more rent. So, uh, you know, assignments and sublets used to be a nice section 20 years ago. It's of less relevance now because landlords don't want you to sublet or even give your lease to a friend uh, permanently, you know, we're buying a house, you take my apartment, landlords will say no, I I want market rent for that unit. Next unit, next uh, slide. Uh, sweet metering it used to be that electricity was included. Um, now landlords are trying to pass that off onto the tenants. Check at the beginning of the tenancy, you know, what your rent is. Ask your landlord how much the hydro bills are. It can really bankrupt people if 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 the lease says you have to pay for your own utilities. Um, Mary, how much how much do you want me to go to? I see it's seven seventeen. We have until eight o'clock. I know there's some people who are eager with questions, but yeah. uh, well, I can get through this yeah, in, I, in, in five I minutes. Think. Okay, I can I can get through this, and then we can have a time for a chat. Happy happy to do that. The next slide, please. Okay. 
Occupancy rights of family members, tenancy terminated if the tenant dies. Um, if the tenant leaves a spouse left in the unit might be deemed a tenant, but you have to let your landlord know what is a spouse and no other rights of other family members. So this is a huge problem for mom who dies and, the, and, and a son or daughter wants to stay on. Social housing, it's a nightmare because you can imagine the tenant has social housing, they're paying a reduced rent, they die, there's no spouse, kids can't stay on. It's, uh, it's a real social problem, if you ask me. Uh, next slide. Uh, landlord and tenant board processes. If you have a dispute with your landlord, the landlord will give you notice. Uh, that notice should in have enough information so that you know what the issue is. It, the notice will unhelpfully say you have to leave by such and such a date, and most people, many people do. Why it says this, I don't know. You do not have to leave. Some notices can be remedied. Um, and, and sometimes um, you should go to a hearing. So when the landlord says, I want to move back into my apartment or I want to sell the unit, you should leave by March 30. Don't leave. Uh, you know, get some legal advice. The landlord will have to actually bring an eviction application to evict you. But many people see this notice. You have to leave. It's very upsetting. You have to read in the fine print on the second page. It says you don't have to leave. And who knows, like the deal, the house might go through, the landlord might change his mind about moving in. Uh, don't leave without legal advice, go to your local clinic. Um, the next slide, Ugh, and I, I think we've all heard about uh, tribunal backlogs. Um, it was a very interesting time over the pandemic. Um, before the pandemic, I think it was like 98.5% of tenants paid their rent in full and on time. Uh, then there was the pandemic. The sheriff stopped enforcing evictions for a long period of time. I think that arrears number went to 90%. So I think 90% of people still paid their rent on time and on full, but, but they were not ready for the huge number of tenants that maybe lost their job or stopped paying the rent because eviction, uh, evictions weren't being enforced. So the tribunal backlog is a real problem. You know, you have an issue with your landlord. Sometimes it's just better to talk to them, uh, deal with it, exchange emails. It, it, you can wait. Uh, you know, I tried to help young people who had a leaky roof. Uh, I said, you should short your rent. I'll help you. They said, that's too risky. They filed a maintenance application. Two years later, they still don't have their hearing. This is ridiculous. Okay. This is ridiculous. So, uh, backlogs are really affecting people's faith uh, in the justice system in Ontario. Next slide. Evictions. This is another thing that lots of tenants don't know. Um, uh, so evictions only for the reasons set out in the residential tenancy. It's like, I get, I, I get the tenants send me these notices. Landlord says, get out by Friday. Like, oh my God, don't you know anything? Um, and and there are eviction procedures, and only the sheriff uh, can change, can physically evict the tenant and change the locks, not the landlord. So the landlord has to go to the tribunal, get an order, take the order to the sheriff, and he was really called the sheriff. Again, arcane language, It's we, we often call it the Office of Enforcement, but he is the sheriff. And he's the only guy that can come and change the locks. So I often attend illegal evictions and the tenant says the locks have been changed. I say to the landlord, where's the order? Where, where, where is the sheriff's notice that the sheriff is coming? And when the police are there, I say the sheriff has not come. Change those locks back. This is an illegal eviction. The sheriff did not do this. And I think the police know that by now, but, but who knows? Um, and the next slide... Reasons for eviction, non-payment of rent is the most common ground, disturbing landlords or other tenants, impairing safety is a big one, uh, damage, and the landlords have a right of inspection, so that's where they find the damage. Uh, illegal act is a, is a big one often in public housing complexes. 
Um, if you misrepresent your income uh, in social housing, that's a problem. Overcrowding. It has to be really overcrowded uh, to get to that threshold of eviction. And then we look at the building codes and see what the, the, the municipality thinks is overcrowding. And the bad one is, um, is landlord or purchaser's own use. And so the landlord's not happy with the tenant that's been there for too long. And then they just say, well, I'm moving in myself or I'm selling the house and the purchaser wants it and you have to leave. And these are dirty trick evictions. And I never used to do them in the beginning of my practice in 1997. I never did them as a law student in 1992. Uh, I do them regularly now. So it's, it's in the landlord's playbook for getting rid of good tenants. The next uh, slide, after, if you have been lawfully evicted, you only have 72 hours uh, to get your stuff. This is a bit inconvenient for people. The Tories had 48 hours, the Liberals gave you one more day, 72 hours to get your stuff or get a written agreement from your landlord that, okay, I'm coming on Saturday, but get that written agreement in email. Uh, cause you might lose all your stuff. Uh, the next slide. Um, so, and this is what you learn in law school. The answer to every legal question is it depends. So it's complicated. It will depend on the facts. It will be ten, it depend on evidence. It will depend on the timing. It will depend on the legislation. It's very hard to give and, and people don't really appreciate this. And this is why lawyers in part cost so much money. Um, you know, if you have a plug drain, you call the plumber and he says it's 70 bucks an hour and the part's going to cost 50 bucks. And I think it's going to be 220, right? You ask a lawyer, how much is it going to cost? Who knows? Who knows how complicated? Who knows what the other, how the other side's going to respond? Who knows? Uh, all kinds of things. So this is why people don't like lawyers, uh, because we're kind of, we, we seem to be not very helpful, but really it's very difficult to give uh, people legal advice because you really need to interview them properly and get all kinds of facts. And really, if you ask four lawyers uh, a legal question, you might actually get five different answers. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. And this is why we like to do public legal education so you can see how complicated it is. And, uh, and as I say, like the landlord taking pictures, if a tenant asked me that, well, what would I say? Well, one court said this and one court said that. I don't know what the answer is. Depends on the judge you're going to get, I guess. Uh, the next slide. Um, the red flags. So when, when you rent, and I realize everybody's jammed up, and I realize there's not a lot of good stuff out there, um, but there are always red flags uh, when you rent. Um, you know, are they lying to you uh, from the beginning or do they know what the law is? So if you look at the lease that says no boyfriends, no pets, they are lying to you. And of course, the problem is if you tell them that you know their rights, you're not going to get the apartment. Um, do they understand that they're running a business? I mean, you're landlord after landlord after landlord. It's my place. Well, it is not their place. Uh, it's their it's their business investment that they've given to you, and it is your place. Um, this is another one that I, I, you know, I hear all the time. And and all those little, you, you know, I want cash. I would never deal with a lawyer, a uh, 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 landlord said, I want cash. It won't give you receipts. Um, and everybody, well, if you're, you know, many people will be alert to the sexual harassment vibe. It happens, and it's terrible. Uh, so, and, and, and actually I find the bigger landlords are, tend to be more professional. The smaller ones I have a lot of tr trouble with because they really don't understand the law and they really don't understand that it's a business. Um, I think we're nearing the end. So these are helpful websites. Um, and, and I should have changed the quality rights, uh, uh org. Uh, that's not right. Uh, they've changed their name. I, I did want to make that change, and I'm sorry. But we have a we have an a, a, ACTO has a website. Clio is a very good source of tenant information. 
go to the government uh, website. They have good uh, uh, information about how to file applications and how to how to create marshal the defense. Um, and the last website is um, we are the next web. The last slide I think is um, why are we in this mess? And it's imperative that. I think everybody understand the systemic and political issues at play. And when there's an election time and some counselor comes to your door or some MPP comes to your door, you have to ask them about the housing crisis. We eliminated effective rent control in 1997. We got rid of the Rental Housing Protection Act that said you just couldn't take down housing if it had, I think, four or more units, stop the condo craze. Um, the province stopped building social housing. We used to build 7,000 units of social housing a year for 30 years. That would be a quarter million units. And then in 1995, we stopped. Uh, the province has downloaded social housing to municipalities who can't repair it. Uh, and the answer to the feds in the province is we are just going to leave it to the private market to fix things. And federally, home ownership is the policy goal. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, Toronto is half tenants. And you ain't, you ain't owning a home anytime soon. So it is dreadful. Uh, it's, a, it's a crisis that has been 30 years in the making. And uh, it, it's really people need, I mean, there, I work with people who don't know that it can be fixed, uh, but let's hope it can be fixed. And it, it really starts with understanding the social and political um, landscape that has just allowed capitalism to run rampant when it comes to housing. 96% of housing in Ontario is in private hands. Who thought that was a good idea? In European cities, it, it's 75%. And they don't have the same kind of problems that we do. So um, it's, and, and people don't think this. People think, well, there's all kinds of social housing and everybody on social assistance is in social housing. This is not true. Most housing is in private hands. So I'm, I'm happy to stop talking and uh, turn it over to people who have questions and comments. Um, thank you so much, Karen. Um, I think we're just going to stop recording just in case folks have personal questions. Um, and actually here at Madison, I can do that. 